Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, of whom more later. I was at an antiques fair recently and I spotted a book on a stall that took my interest. Handling London's Underground Traffic. Now I have a lot of books on handling London's underground traffic, but this one caught my eye for two reasons. Firstly, it was written by J.P. Thomas, and secondly, it was published in 1928. The book was published by London's Underground. It seems that at the time, the organisation was not referring to itself as London Underground. I'm sort of reminded of the brief but unfortunate period when the London Transport Museum called itself London's Transport Museum. I don't know why, but that really annoyed me. I'm also not a huge fan of the name Transport for London, but that's a whole other issue. Not enough of an issue for me to make a video about it, though. My reasons for disliking it are entirely petty. I was talking about a book, wasn't I? The book was, as I say, written by J.P. Thomas, the operating manager. And that's interesting to me, because he would go on to be one of the architects of the New Works programme, the scheme that would revolutionise the underground with new trains, new stations and new lines. His ideas would ultimately lead to the Victoria and Jubilee lines, both of which would open long after his retirement. A lot of what he proposed would prove impractical for various reasons, mostly involving money and wartime damage to the network. But nevertheless, he was a forward-thinking man who really deserves to be remembered alongside the likes of Frank Pick, Charles Holden and Harry Beck in terms of people who changed London's transport network for the better. Speaking of Frank Pick, he provides an introduction to the book. Pick was the managing director of the Underground at this time. But not just the Underground, the Underground Group also encompassed a number of bus and tram operators. Pick took a holistic view of the network, that it should be efficient, convenient and aesthetically pleasing, not merely driven by short-term profits like so many transport projects in the city, but by what was best for London as a whole. That's not to say he didn't care about money, and in this foreword he's quite candid about the fact. I'll quote the final paragraph. To save labour, yet to increase efficiency. To give better service to the public, yet to raise the standard of wages. To attract traffic, and to bring the underground railways to prosperity. These are the ultimate aims of the multiplicity of details, pursued with care and ingenuity as described in the pages of this book. So what was the underground like in 1928? Well, Thomas and Pick's aim was to create something reminiscent of a civic transport authority. But that's not what the underground group was. Rather, it was a commercial enterprise which, under the leadership of Albert Stanley, later Lord Ashfield, had become something much more. In 1933, the Underground Group became the main component of London Transport, which was a civic transport authority. This map shows the network as it stood in 1928. Note that this is not the iconic Harry Beck map, whose first edition wouldn't be released until 1933. This kind of illustrates the problem of reading the old map, especially when it's reproduced, as it is here, in black and white. Before we go into that map, I think it's time to talk about this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Hello, I'm the seal of approval, and I'd just like to say how much I approve of Surfshark VPN. These days, everyone's trying to snoop on you online, so having a VPN is an excellent idea. Surfshark's advanced encryption will keep you safe from all those dreadful people. Why I particularly approve of Surfshark is because it has servers in over a hundred countries which not only gives you the maximum options for rerouting your data, but it means that you can access streaming services from other countries. You can circumvent censorship by governments and corporations, and even get the best possible prices when shopping online by taking advantage of region-specific pricing. But what had me clapping my fins with joy was the discovery that Surfshark, uniquely, can be used on an unlimited number of devices. If all that wasn't enough, Viewers of this channel can get three months extra free on a two-year plan by following the link in the description below and entering the code JAGO. Why, there's even a 30-day money-back guarantee. This really did have me oinking with undiluted approval, even though as a seal I do not own any electronic devices. This has been a message from the seal of approval. Goodbye. 
The underground was much smaller in those days, and in fact there's a helpful list of statistics in the book. The one that stood out to me was that there were 125 stations owned by the underground, for a total of 194 served. That's in contrast to the present, where there are 265 stations owned by the underground, for a total of 272. One of the biggest sources for the extra stations is the Metropolitan Line, which until 1933 was a separate entity. It does get discussed in the book, but mostly in the context of something that shares track with the district. The Waterloo and City Line is barely mentioned, because until 1994 it was part of what we'd now call the National Rail Network. And as I said earlier, the Victoria and Jubilee Lines didn't yet exist. The Elizabeth Line doesn't officially count as a tube line. And also it didn't exist. I don't know why I even mentioned it. But even of the lines that did exist, they were far shorter. The Piccadilly line only went as far as Finsbury Park. And though it's hard to make out in black and white, it terminated at Hammersmith. The branch of the Northern Line that now goes to High Barnet and Mill Hill East only ran to Archway, which, in those days, confusingly, was called Highgate. The Central Line did not branch off to West Ryslip in the west, and in the east it ceased at Liverpool Street. But at the same time, there are quite a few stations that don't exist anymore. York Road, Aldwych, Down Street and Brompton Road are still on the Piccadilly Line. The district still serves South Acton and South End. You could still get the Bakerloo to Watford Junction. And back then, the Northern City Line was owned by the Metropolitan Railway, so it's still on the tube map. Some stations are unfamiliar because they've been renamed. Green Park is still Dover Street here. Arsenal is still Gillespie Road. At this time, the Northern Line was not a thing. Well, it was, but it wasn't called that. At that time, it was still two separate lines sharing track. The Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway and the City and South London Railway, which the book refers to as the Hampstead Line and the City Line, respectively. At this point, the extension from Clapham Common to Morden was only two years old, and it was only four years since they'd reached Edgware. Curiously, this was the time when the Hampstead Line, the Piccadilly Line and the Bakerloo Line were gathered together under the name of the London Electric Railway. I must admit, I've never really understood the thinking behind this. The lines were still separate, to all intents and purposes, and the underground group never gathered the other lines they took over into that group. More research is needed on my part, I think. Anyway, the London Electric Railway was, on paper at least, a thing that existed from 1910 to 1933. A lot of the information in this book is perhaps a little eclectic for this video, things like staffing, signalling, communication, and so forth. The kind of things that might make for their own dedicated videos in future where I can nerd out properly. The book does, however, go into a lot of detail about rolling stock, and who doesn't like trains? Only monsters. The book not only includes current trains, but historic trains too. Mr Thomas is quite proud of the 1920 District Line trains, which were the first all-steel carriages on that line and had these rather distinctive oval windows at the end. These trains are more commonly known as the F-Stock or the Dreadnoughts. The London Electric Railway lines plus the City Line were also using stock introduced in 1920, which had air-operated sliding doors. This feature was something of a novelty back then. But older trains, known as the 1906 stock, were still in service. On the Central Line, then the Central London Railway, trains introduced in 1903 were still in use, but the underground group had had them refurbished to bring them in line with the 1920 stock. On the Baker Loo Line, there was a different kind of train in use for the section from Queen's Park to Watford. This line was shared between the London and North Western Railway and the London Electric Railway and the train is a joint design between the two companies. It was faster than your average tube train at 45 miles per hour, and it was built slightly higher to make it a little more compatible with mainline station platforms. But the pride of the underground was the new standard stock, which had been introduced in 1927 for the City Line extension to Morden. This would go on to have a long and illustrious career, arguably far longer than it should have had. But in 1928, it was state-of-the-art, with its air-operated doors, noise reduction and steel construction. It would, as the name implies, go on to become the standard tube train on the deep-level lines. I've only really given a brief look at this book, which I suspect will become an extremely valuable part of my library. If you're interested in the history of the tube, I can heartily recommend it. 
The first four decades of the 20th century were a time of massive growth and change on the network. And I think I'll finish with another quote from Frank Pick's foreword. Even as I write this brief note of introduction, I know that the position is changing, that progress cannot be checked or thwarted in a living organisation, that what is written in the book will need amplification and amendment almost as soon as it is published. To those who know and use the underground railways, the impression must always be dynamic. Well, I hope you enjoyed this roaring tale from the tube. If so, please do consider leaving a like and subscribing, if you will, for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your much appreciated support. You are the JP Thomas to my Frank Pick. I would also like to thank Surfshark for their sponsorship. Check out the link in the description below to take advantage of their generous offer. And I will see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.